how do we fight climate anxiety? We tell butterfly stories, and butterfly stories are stories of hope and optimism about the future of our planet. And so that's what I'd like to discuss this morning and talk to you about in terms of how it really impacts people and how we think about it in terms of the butterfly effect. And I'd like to share with you a term that I came up with. It's called the butterfly story effect because it kind of embodies and pays homage to this TED talk, which is the butterfly effect. And it also has the story in there. So I put this term together, the butterfly story effect. And I thought I would check it out on Google. And I checked it out on Google, couldn't find it. Checked it out everywhere on the internet, couldn't find it. I checked it out on AI chat, I couldn't find it. I think we have something unique happening here at this TED Talk. I think we may have stumbled upon a very, very unique saying or expression that we are now going to share with the world. And I couldn't be more excited about that. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about some stories. And the first story I'd like to share with you is a story about how my wife uh, tripled our carbon footprint on a trip to Florida. You see, we were escaping the Great White North and heading south, and I was going to drive right through, right through to the border of Florida, 20 hours, going for it. And we got to the border of West Virginia and Virginia. And I said, "Hun, we're running a little sh short on gas here. We better pull in and get some gas, because there's a bit of an exchange here in the highway. And I don't know how long it's going to be before we hit another gas station. And so we pulled into a mom and pa shop type of gas station. A young man came out. How are you all doing? He had that southern accent and southern hospitality. I said, oh, I'm doing fine. Where are you all going? I said, oh, we're heading down to Florida, escaping the great white north up there. Oh, great. Anyway, got gassed up, exchanged some money. My wife said, uh, hon, why don't you let me take over for a while and you have a little nap? Now, she's an excellent driver. But I thought, no, and she said, just, just, I'll keep, just an hour. I said, okay. I let her behind the wheel, got behind the, uh, in, in the passenger side. I was out, out like a light. Now, she told me she'd wake me up in an hour, but when I woke up, it was an hour and a half. And so I rubbed the sleep from my eyes, and there's a sign coming up towards us, that caught in the glitter of the headlights, and it said, Beckley, 10 miles ahead. I said, hon, I just saw a sign go by that said, Beckley, 10 miles ahead. We've already been through Beckley. And it suddenly dawned on me and my wife that at that interchange, she turned the car around and was heading as fast as possible back to the Great White North. I said, hon, I think I better drive. I got in that car, turned it around, headed south. Now remember, we had driven an hour and a half north. Now we've driven an hour and a half south. Guess what? We had to get gas. Where'd we get gas? How you all do? I thought you all were going to Florida. <laughs> I said, so did I. So I tell this story because stories have impact. Stories evoke emotion. Stories project us into something else. And that's why when you see TV commercials of cars, they don't show you under the hood. Don't talk about how much horsepower it's got. They show you that car heading off into the mountains or into some beautiful spot. And you can picture yourself there. And it's the same in business. We have now what we call case studies, right? Case studies. Case studies are just stories of how somebody used a successful product or a service, how they implemented it. And they want us to think we can be successful as well. And so stories have been around for a while, and they've been around the last two decades in terms of climate change. And there's a lot of doom and gloom around climate change. And I understand that. I get that. And you know, it's not a bad thing, because climate change, doom and gloom, causes us anxiety. And anxiety is a healthy emotion. It protects us from harm. 
And so we have the fight or flee instinct. And since we have no planet that we can flee to, we have to fight. And so kudos to the people in the streets that have been putting the signs up saying, save the planet. Good on them, because they've woken up the governments of this world. They've woken up the United Nations. They've woken up private enterprise. And so I think we should applaud them for what they've done in terms of bringing this to the attention of the world. But at the same time, they've also caused anxiety and stress. And I really think it's time we communicate some of the things that are happening out there in a positive light. Really, really important, especially overcoming anxiety that people are having right now. So I think some of those efforts could be channeled a little bit at this juncture, because it is undisputable that climate change is in fact happening. And so as we continue looking at that, you can see that more and more people are being employed by the private sector. And so we have graduates from universities and community colleges who are scientists, ecologists, environmentalists, engineers, who are involved sometimes in environmental studies, being employed by these firms to help make a difference. And these folks are waking up every day trying to make our planet secure for the kids in the future. And they're doing some great work out there. You may have heard recently about nuclear fusion. They're talking about that being an artificial sun. You know, they're taking it from the lab and putting it on the streets, eventually empowering entire cities. Or you may have also heard about drones that are planting over 10,000 trees in a day. 10,000 trees a day, they have a little seedling and blow it into the earth and it pops up and they have GPS figuring out where it's going to be most susceptible to growing or going to grow more successfully. And so this is really important that we recognize and acknowledge that the private sector is doing its thing even though they may have been demonized in the past. And that actually leads me to another story. A story about when I took a trip to England with my wife last year. Yes, we're still going together, we're still married. And took a trip to England and we stayed near the Kensington Palace. And I said one day, let's, let's go for a walk to the palace. And we walked along the sidewalk, some beautiful row houses there with steps going up. And as we were walking along, a gentleman pulled alongside of us in a Land Rover. And he reached down and opened a flap in the Land Rover and pulled out a charging cable. I couldn't, couldn't see what I, I couldn't believe it. I'm watching what he's doing, and here's what he did. He plugged it in to a lamppost. So here's my wonderful wife and the lamppost and the charger plugged into a lamppost. I was apoplectic. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I walked up to him boldly. I said, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm from Canada and I've never seen anything like this before. And he said, first of all, I knew you're from North America because of your accent and I knew you're from Canada because you started off by saying I'm sorry. <laughs> it's universal. Anyway, we hit it off, we had a great dialogue. He showed me he has a little app on his phone, taps into it, plugs it in, goes to sleep, gets up in the morning, comes out, is fully charged, and off he goes. That particular lamppost can be used by anybody else during the day. They pull in there and plug it in. I was inspired by his story, inspired when I got home to look into this a little more. And that's what butterfly stories do, they inspire us. And when I looked into this when I got home and did a little research, I found out there were 350,000 lampposts in London, England that can be converted, as they say, into charging stations. And I did some more research and I looked up New York City. New York City has 250,000 lampposts that are suitable for conversion. And 50% of the people in New York City park on the street that own vehicles and live there. So this is amazing things that are happening. And I think it's important to tell those optimistic stories. And I think it's important to tell them in the context of the butterfly stories. The butterfly story was something that was coined by Dr. Lorenz. Dr. Lorenz was a meteorologist, got his 
doctorate from MIT, and he came up with a model, a mathematical model, that said a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil could impact a tornado in Texas. Now, he knew this wasn't really possible, except mathematically. But now we have something else happening that wasn't around back then. We have the internet. And we have the opportunity here to share a butterfly story. And we have an opportunity to use this device right here to share that butterfly story. We have the internet. We have social media. And so you could tell a butterfly story to someone from Brazil have it land on a laptop in, let's say, Texas, in a teacher's laptop. And that teacher could spread that story to 20 students about, let's say, drones planting trees. And they could get enthused, and they could go home and tell their parents and their siblings, and they could tell people in their contact list on LinkedIn or whatever, and that story can spread. And then we have the ripple effect taking place that Dr. Lorenz really dreamed about. And so dreams really can come true in this context. We can, in fact, send out butterfly stories. And I'd like to leave you with two words. I recently looked at a report from the American Psychological Association, a report on mental health and climate change. And at the end, it concluded, and it said two things, two words that can be done to help. It said, foster optimism. What powerful words those are. Foster optimism. And so that's what we can do. We can foster optimism by telling a butterfly story. Thank you. <laughs>